Hello, my name's John Darlington, and I'm the Executive Director of World Monuments Fund in Britain. And I'm going to be your host for this evening. So firstly, a very warm welcome to all of you who've joined us here. Uh, I think it's going to be a fabulous event uh, on my watch, all about Benelie Viaducts. Now, you've seen Benelie Viaduct in the, that introductory video. Uh, it's a magnificent structure which, which floats almost ethereally across the, the Airwash Valley, spanning Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire in the North East Midlands of the UK. So absolutely fabulous site. And the reason why World Monuments Fund is involved with Benley is because it's on our 2020 watch list, uh, as is implied indeed by uh, the series, which is called On My Watch. Uh, and the watch list is a series of 25 sites which are selected every two years from across the world. Uh, and those sites are places which are important in themselves, which are in, uh, in some kind of need. They need a solution. Uh, and indeed, they, the, the solutions that we might apply at Benley can be shared universally, again, across the world. So this is very much one of the reasons why we're here today, to, to begin and to, to share some of the, the story of Benley. Uh, world Monuments has been working at Benley with, uh, in, in partnership with the Friends of Benley Viaduct and with the Railway Paths Limited, who are the owners of the viaduct, and a host of other partners. And our ambition is to, to repurpose this magnificent uh, iron giant of the Victorian period. So that, that's the ambition. Now, a few things about this event. Uh, the first thing to say is that uh, there is a live transcript available. If you look at the bottom of your screen uh, and you should see a live transcript button or the more button. So if you'd like subtitles for this event, please click on that. You can move that around the screen. You can alter the size of it uh, as you wish. Uh, bear in mind that sometimes the transcription isn't 100% accurate, but we think it's worth doing because it reaches a wider audience. So if it doesn't understand my UK English, please forgive it. Uh, the second thing to say is that this event is hosted in partnership with the New York branch, the New York chapter of the American Institute of Architects. And for those of you who are joining from that organization or related to that organization, you can gain credits, AIA credits. You'll know what I mean if you're part of them. Uh, just again, check the, the chat function below and that will tell you how to access that. Now, the most important thing about this event is our, are the three guests that we've got who are engaging, who are very knowledgeable, knowledgeable about railway architecture and talk from an international, a national and a local perspective. So I'm quickly going to say hello to all three of them and introduce you to them. So the first is Tim Dunn, who is a railway historian, an author and a broadcaster of the, the television show, amongst other television shows, the broadcaster of the architecture that railways built, which I know is available not only in the UK, but across the world, because my stepfather in France is a, is a, a, a big fan, Tim. So, Tim, welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for having me along here. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a great opportunity. Fabulous. Uh, my next guest is Kieran Lee. Now, Kieran is the community engagement officer for the Friends of Benley Viaduct. Kieran is a retired special needs teacher, uh, but he's also a, a, a real enthusiast for not only the viaduct, but in fact the, the area and the conservation of the area. So, Kieran, lovely to see you. Yeah, good evening, everybody. And we're absolutely delighted to be taking part in this event. Thank you, Kieran. And last but by no means least, all the way from Philadelphia and the US, we have Rebecca Chan. And Rebecca is the executive director of the Friends of the Rail Park in Philadelphia. She's a historic preservationist and she will have uh, a, a, a view of a complementary site in the United States. So, Rebecca, really nice to see you. Thanks so much, John. It's great to be here. <laughs> Excellent. So there's my three guests. We've got a lot to get through. Uh, we've got just under an hour to get through it. Uh, so there's, there's an awful lot to do. Uh, if you've got, I've got a series of questions for, for my guests, but if you have questions yourself, please use the, the Q&A function again in the bar down below. 
And after I've asked a number of questions, hopefully we'll get to those uh, and I'll, I'll pose them those to, to my guests uh, before the end of the hour. So, so do use that function. Right, let's get stuck in because I say there's an awful lot to get through. Uh, and my first question is actually for, for Tim. And that is, Tim, can you tell us a little bit about uh, how did he first come across Benley? And perhaps how does it fit within the panoply of rich architecture in this country related to railways? Well, we are really spoiled for choice in Britain, the uh, the cradle, I suppose, of, of, of railway technology. But, um, my interest uh, in Benley is quite recent. Um, my work as historical geographer and travel editor means that I'm quite familiar with the work of, of you guys, the World Monuments Fund and your lists. But I, I, I love buildings. I absolutely adore buildings. I've been fascinated by, by, by the, the built environment since I was a child. And a few years ago, I had the idea to showcase some of these interesting buildings that I'd come across over my life um, that the railways connect together. A TV company kind of spun it all together and put it into a series. And we managed to find about 100 places across Europe we thought were quite interesting, some big, some small. Um, but all of them were linked by one thing, actually two things. One, they had great stories. And two, they have passionate and enthusiastic supporters. Um, and that's where Benley came in. You know, because um, I'm ashamed to say that despite being a railway enthusiast and, a, and an alleged expert for, what, 40 years, um, I'd never heard of it. And, and, and yet it's so extremely important. So um, I've put together a few little slides just to kind of show everyone a bit of context. Uh, there's some pictures of me at different places we've been for television programme, just showing you the wealth of, of stuff we've got, everything from roundhouses to stations, from viaducts. And the railways have been responsible for re some remarkable structures. Um, and Benley is there, some of the standing there, play, hidden in plain sight, I always say, Benley. Now, this is a little bit of a, uh, a story of Benley. Let's, let's go back into, into, into its history. Beginning in the, in the 1870s, um, to cut a very, very long story short, railway mania swept across Britain in the preceding decades. This little country was crisscrossed by more than 7,000 miles of railway track by this point, 1870. Um, and most of it was to connect industries, because that's where the real money was. It wasn't all about passengers, not, not at all. Um, and there are hundreds of independent railway companies vying to, to crisscross the country, vying for traffic and building new routes. And so in yellow there, I've marked the dominant uh, railway of the, of the region that Benel is in, the Midland Railway. But the, the, uh, the Great Northern Railway, who are actually in red, and they were way over there to the east, over to the right-hand side, they wanted to get across to all the coal fields over there on the left. So rather than going on the Midland Territory, they went straight across the valley tops. So that means they go across the, the valleys and across the hills. And they got to the Erewash Valley, which is where uh, Benley is. And it's marked there with a, with a big, uh, big white arrow to help. And on, on, on the next uh, slide, you'll see that actually normally how railways cross via, uh, uh, valleys in Britain is by brick viaducts. You just knock up a, chi a, a cheap brick viaduct because they're cheap as chips, bricks, easy to do. That, that's actually the Welland Viaduct, not a million miles away. Um, but at Benley, there's a problem. You can't put bricks down because the whole valley floor, the Erewash Valley, is actually prone to subsidence because all the coal mines have been tunnelled underneath and they've been changing geology and the, ge the geomorphology of the area. So you can't go putting thousands of tonnes of bricks on the valley floor. It's heavy, it'll probably sink down a few times. So onto the next slide, you'll see what they actually did. The Great Northern Railway had this idea. Well, the data government from Rails actually it wasn't the first, but they used this incredible structure and they built wrought iron latticework piers and cast iron trusses. So the vertical bits are wrought iron and, and, the, and the horizontal bits on top where the tracks go is actually uh, is, is cast iron. But crucially, this kind of viaduct, this kind of structure is a lot uh, lighter than bricks. They rivet it all together and assemble it chunk by jigsaw chunk. And up it goes in 18 months. And the main lattice work sits on these lovely little feet you see sitting here. So the whole viaduct is supported by those, those feet. And there's no bolting down at all. Now, Binley wasn't unique. And see on this slide here, you can see this is actually iron being used elsewhere in railway viaducts at the time, long before steel that came along. In the USA, we had uh, wooden trestles. I'm sure many of you are familiar with those. Um, but in the UK, in the most challenging situations, we had like this one here. This is the Crumlin viaduct in Wales. It was once Britain's tallest viaduct with wrought iron lattice piers below and cast iron trusses on top. It's just like Benley. And if you go into the next slide as well, you'll see it again in, in, in colour. 
And that gives you an idea, really, what Benley would have looked like uh, with trains going across it. I mean, just look at that. It, it, it's, it's absolutely wonderful. And the scale is extraordinary, those spindly legs. But on the next slide, you'll see exactly why Benley is so important now, because that's Crumlin coming down. The fact that Crumlin was demolished, there it is, going, going, gone. And lots of Britain's railways, like the one that went over Crumlin, and indeed Benley, closed in the years after World War I, uh, World War II. If you're living in Britain and, and watching this, you'll know this very well. We had the beaching cuts there, they're known as, and other associated closures. But mainly because after World War II, we had car ownership rising, as you did in the States as well. Um, and a few fewer passengers used railways. And as Britain's industry declined, we had less goods traffic as well. So all over Britain, this infrastructure is completely redundant. And the tracks and the bridges are removed. And of course, Kremlin, uh, they demolished the viaduct because it's so tall. Now, another famous wrought iron viaduct is on the next slide, which is actually the Tay Bridge. And that came down in a terrible storm of 1879 with a loss of 75 lives. That was, that was coming down just as Ben Lee went up. And also we've got Staithes Viaduct, also gone in the UK. Bella Viaduct, also gone. Ben Lee is a survivor. And um, actually there are some pictures coming up in, and in, actually in Kieran's presentation of those other viaducts as well. But the only one actually anything like this place uh, is actually Meldon Viaduct on the screen now. Now, Meldon Viaduct in the south of the UK, in Devon, is rather splendid. It's actually quite small comparatively. Um, it's set away from population centres, so it's not really doing a really useful community function at the heart of a community. Um, but what sets Benerley aside from, say, Meldon, the only other one just like it, is its survival as an engineering marvel of the go-getting Victorian era. Because the scrap men said it's too expensive to take down and the fact that local people took it to their heart. And that's why we put it into the architecture of the railways built in series one. And that's why we came back to it again in the architecture of the railways built in series two. It's a great story and people love it. So actually on the next slide, I'll put a little clip actually of, of, of why we came back to the viaduct. My next visit is to an old friend that is now going through a bit of a renaissance. In the last series of the architecture of the railways built, we visited a remarkable structure that strides across the Erewash Valley in Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire. Since we last came here though, the team restoring it have made great progress and despite today's pretty naff weather, I just had to come along and see exactly what they've been up to. This is Benerley Viaduct, known locally as the Iron Giant. It certainly deserves its nickname. It's the largest wrought iron viaduct in the country and stands at an incredible 18 metres high and almost half a kilometre long. Transporting goods, commuters and even holidaymakers, Benerley Viaduct served this community for nearly 100 years. This recently discovered and never before seen footage shows Benerley in its prime. But sadly, in 1968, Benerley was deemed beyond repair and closed. Meaning for more than 50 years, this iron giant has been in railway limbo. But in 2016, modern technology allowed experts to get a close look at this beautiful old viaduct and they realised the structure was remarkably sound. With this epiphany, suddenly, Benerley had a bright new future. Bit of background for you there. And, and the reaction we got on social media was extraordinary. This is a tiny proportion of the literally dozens, if not hundreds of tweets and Facebook messages and emails that we got. And I know the team got as well after the first broadcast. And this truly is a giant hiding in plain sight. Because it's been closed for so long and because the main roads are so far away, people in Britain just don't know about Benley. But now, now they do. And more people are going to know that it's there. Now, a very wise architectural historian once said to me on the next slide, um, that actually, if a building ceases to have a purpose, it dies. It slips off the radar. Give it a purpose, then money can be found. Give it a purpose and the building lives again.
Now, that's what's happening at Benerley, in my view. I'm passionately keen uh, for old buildings to find new uses. Um, and I think that when the rails and, tra rails and trains have gone, a new purpose had to be found. And I think this poster made me realise more than anything else that uh, Stephen Miller's ship did for them. This once old industrial giant that took uh, coal to, the, to, the, to the, uh, the power stations and people to the seaside has just become Britain's largest wrought iron seaside pleasure pier. And I think people will visit it just for the joy of walking over it and to be part of the next chapter of Benelli's story. And I do wish the whole team the greatest of success. Thank you. Tim, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, we, we asked him to do essentially to condense probably 150 years of history. Into <laughs> so, so well done for that. Remarkable. Talk quickly for that. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, and I'm sure you've got lots of questions for Tim, but save them for later because I'm now going to switch to Kieran. And uh, Kieran, uh, you're you're the, the local voice, I guess. No, well, no, I guess you are the local voice. And so my question for you is: is why did the local community get involved at Benley, and what's been the most recent catalyst for change? I think the best way I can answer those questions is actually through the slides in the presentation. So if you could uh, put the first slide on, um, you should be able to see a picture of the viaduct. So I'll just wait for that to come on. Now, no, I mean, the, 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 it's on now. Ah, there we are. There we are. All right. So, um, I and mean, I'll be talking about the role of the, uh, the you know, the community in this uh, in this fabulous project. Um, we are going to open the viaduct up to local people to walk across the top of the viaduct. People will be able to walk underneath the viaduct, and we'll be connecting the viaduct to the local walks and trails. And community is at the very heart of this project. Um, we are working in partnership with the owners, Railway Paths Limited, and the actual existence of this viaduct, it's a tribute to the local community who fought in the 1970s and 1980s and 1990s to prevent this viaduct from being demolished. So if we can have a look at the, uh, the next slide, please. Um, there were a series of um, whole, in, here we are, right. in the 1960s, there was a huge rationalisation of the, uh, the railways in the British Isles, and these fabulous wrought iron structures across the country were being demolished, so the Crumlin Viaduct in South Wales, the Beeler in the Pennines, uh, Dowry Dell, uh, Staithes in East Yorkshire, they were all demolished. And by the time we got to 1970, there were only two wrought iron viaducts left in the country. One was Benley Viaduct, and the other one was the Meldon Viaduct down in South Wales. And this alarmed local people who were primarily drawn from kind of, you know, railway groups or engineering groups, um, civic societies, industrial archaeologists. And they could see across the country all these viaducts were disappearing. There were two left, and they mounted a campaign to prevent Benley Viaduct from being demolished. And that campaign lasted close on three decades. So we can go to the, the, the next image, please. And at that time, if we look at the, uh, you know, the, what was happening through the headlines of local newspapers. There was a real conflict of narratives regarding what the future of the viaduct should be. Um, on, on the one hand, you had um, a section of the local community who wanted the viaduct to be demolished, who wanted it to be knocked down. And some local councils, they were quite ambivalent as well. But then... On the other side, you had this tenacious group of people who literally fought from the 1970s to the 1990s to keep this viaduct open. And as early as the 1970s, they were promoting the idea of turning Benley Viaduct into a walking and a cycling route. 
Go to the next slide, please. Here, and the slides are there. When you say the next slide, it's just your a lag in your your end. It's, it's not. It's not up on my screen. It's. It's definitely there, Kieran. The conflict of narratives. Uh, changing the narrative. Oh, well, changing the narrative. It's just. It's just come on now. Um, so, in 1998, there was um, a significant uh, development in that the ownership of the viaduct changed hands to uh, an, a new charity called Railway Paths, and they were set up to. Um, provide um, routes for walking and cycling. So this was a huge boost to the campaign. And when a, when a project was developed in 2015, um, a new group called the Friends of Benley Viaduct were formed. And these were primarily drawn from the local community. And we worked to change that narrative and we were active in promoting through exhibitions, through guided walks, through social media, through television, um, to get across that we are incredibly fortunate to have this, have this structure in our locality. And we promoted the idea that Benley Viaduct was an absolutely fabulous community asset which we could all enjoy. And if you move on to the next slide, we took inspiration from um, around the world, really, where these elevated uh, railway structures had been converted um, for the benefit of local people. So in Paris, we had the, uh, the Promenade Planté. Um, in New York, we had the, uh, the High Line that was developed. In London, at the moment, we have the Camden High Line, which is being developed. In Kelowna, in British Columbia, these fantastic wooden trestle viaducts have been turned into a long distance cycling trail. And again, the Reading Viaduct in Philadelphia, this is now part of the rail park. And we took huge inspiration from what was happening in, you know, in different parts of the world. And we thought, well, if it's good enough for Paris and if it's good enough for New York and London, well, it's good enough for Benley Viaduct. And if we look at the next slide, this has led to everybody working really closely together on what we call the Benley Tandem. And in the front of the Benley Tandem, you have the, uh, you have the, uh, the owners, uh, railway paths, who are kind of, um, they are guiding the project forwards. And they're being supported by local councils and MPs and other stakeholders. And driving the project forward, you have the Friends of Benley Viaduct and the community groups and the general public. And when last year the, uh, the World Monuments Fund jumped on board this tandem, this was an absolutely fabulous boost for the project. And we went from being a local and a regional project to one which had a global reach. And this is reflected in all the people who are interested in what is taking place at the moment. Uh, and with us all pulling in the same direction, the funding has come in and we are now tantalizingly close to getting this viaduct reopened uh, later in the year. Now, our project has three main strands to it. The, the first strand is carrying out the critical repairs. So if you look at the image in the bottom right of your screen, there has been work done, some work done on the ironwork, some work on the brick pier bases, and we've had the uh, abutments rebuilt at one end of the viaduct. So the critical restoration work, that has been done. As we're speaking, if you look at the picture on the left, you can see this zigzag ramp taking you to the top. That ramp is being constructed as we speak, and that should be finished by next month. And the third part of the project is putting the deck on the structure so that people will be able to walk and cycle across, and there will be access for all on top of the viaduct so we can all get these fabulous views of the, uh, the Erewash Valley. And that leads me to the next picture, uh, the next image. 
So the viaduct is destined to become the, you know, an iconic centerpiece for our kind of uh, walking and our cycling trails. And, we'll, you know, instead of just being able to cycle underneath the viaduct, we'll be able to cycle on top of the viaduct. Uh, it will be a place where people can get access to nature. It will be a welcoming place for local people. It will be a place for visitors to um, enjoy. But finally, if we go to my final picture, it's, it, it's so much more than a viaduct. And if we ask that question, why have the community become involved? I think because there's consensus in the community that we are just incredibly fortunate to have this fantastic structure on our doorsteps. And people have been inspired by the vision of what this viaduct could become. And you can see the, uh, you know, the picture in the left, the uh, school teacher teaching the children about the viaduct and everything surrounding that. And that helps to give, you know, local children uh, a sense of place. Um, we... People can see the viaduct as a place where the arts can take place, where we can listen to music. We could perhaps have cinema screens projected onto one of the um, abutments. We can have outdoor theatres. And it's a place where the nature is absolutely fabulous and it, people will be able to kind of commune with nature, which is so important after, you know, coming out of this pandemic. So Benelli is, is so much more than just a viaduct. It's a, you know, it, it's, a, it's a fabulous project to be involved in. And it will be open, hopefully, by the end of this year. And um, we are, we'll be looking forwards then to take the viaduct to the, uh, the next stage of its development. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kieran. And it's it's always wonderful to have a local voice and such a passionate local voice of someone who's been deeply involved in this project. So we're now going to move from a local voice, from uh, actually quite a distant voice. Uh, in, in many ways, Benley is, or, or the rail park in Philadelphia is two steps ahead of Benley. So Benley's in the, the stage where the project's coming together. Uh, the rail park, you've, 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 you've delivered things. You've actually got to a stage where you, you have something which people are enjoying. So, so my, my question for Rebecca is uh, just if you could tell us what you've achieved to date and, and how you've achieved it. Sure thing. And so, thanks so much, John. Um, you know, I really love what you said, Kieran, about the Benerly Viaduct owing its existence to community. Um, I'll just say that it's such an honor to be here today to share the story of the rail park. But what I wanna stress is that this project exists, but for the many organizations and individuals that believed in this vision from very early on and worked tirelessly and with tenacity to bring it to life. Um, these infrastructure reuse projects require a diverse cast and crew of partners across all different sectors to believe in these visions. And then groups like World Monuments Fund and Friends of the Benerly Viaduct to really orchestrate the mechanics of the collaboration to see them through. And that's really what we're seeing drive the success of the rail park in Philadelphia. Um, so if you go to my next slide, um, this is the rail park. Um, it's located in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, for those of you who are zooming in from an international uh, kind of vantage point. Philadelphia is a city of about 1.6 million people. It's located about halfway between New York City and Washington, D.C., and the rail park itself bisects the central part of the city, following two former rail lines of the Pennsylvania and Red New Railroads. Um, it's about five kilometers in length, it spans 50 city blocks, and it crosses through more than 10 different neighborhoods. And there are three distinct sections pictured here. Uh, the viaduct, which is the elevated portion of the train track rising up uh, at certain points, several stories in the air, it then gradually slopes down to the cut, which is a portion that is below ground but open to the sky. And then finally, the tunnel, which is a brick vaulted subterranean tunnel. It is so stunning and beautiful. Um, it's about 30 meters wide at its widest point. If you go to my next slide, um, the heritage of the site is very much bound up in railroad history and in the industrialization of Philadelphia. This is a part of the city that was known as the workshop of the world uh, with the Pennsylvania and Reading Railroad um, companies transporting raw materials and finished goods in and out of the city and then later on commuters as well. Uh, and notably, a, a significant portion of the site was also occupied by the Baldwin Motor Company campus, which built steam engines and was shipping them all over the world. Um, and there's still evidence of that history scattered throughout the park to this day um, and that we hope to take advantage of in future phases of the park as well. 
Um, in the more recent past and leading up to its current state, the rail parks heritage was very much impacted by the development of highways, the rise of car culture, and of course, urban renewal, like many other US cities. And as industry in Philadelphia declined and fewer commuters used the trains, the rail lines fell into disrepair with the last trains using the tracks um, doing so in the late 1980s. Um, and the lines have set mostly uh, abandoned since. And the growth and prosperity that was built in the 1800s and 1900s and kind of the impact of the eventual decline of the railroads and the neighborhoods that surround them is a legacy that we continue to grapple with today, um, both from the perspective of reuse of the existing infrastructure and the built environment, but also thinking about um, kind of repairing the cultural fabric of, uh, of our city. And this is intrinsic to Friends of the Rail Park, the organization that I, I steward. Um, so if you go to the next slide, but what I really love about the rail park, um, and this is um, what I love about it is that it's a reuse project that has always been and continues to be a park that is by and for people. Um, the vision for the rail park started by, was started by several neighbors who um, were living in the neighborhood, you know, adjacent to the viaduct uh, almost two decades ago at this point, and they dreamt about creative ways to reuse it. Um, there were lots of different ideas kind of kicking around at the time, you know, ranging from, you know, do we tear this down and, uh, you know, flatten it and build housing on this, or do we turn it into a park and a green space? Um, and so after several studies looking at it from an economic perspective, as well as from an environmental perspective, and of course, a, a kind of preservation lens as well. Um, and I, I should also just know that this is a part of the city um, that has less than 4% tree cover and very, very few green spaces. Um, but it really made sense to, to reuse the space and turn the existing structure into a park. Um, and so this group of neighbors started talking to different people about it and getting them on board and helping them see the vision. Um, and they did this by leading tours, by hosting many fundraisers, and then playful campaigns like this photo on the, the right. And if you go to my next slide. So I would say a major milestone for the rail park was cementing a collaboration between an innovative group of partners that was focused on the first phase of the rail park. So this is a quarter mile stretch out of that five kilometers um, that I had mentioned earlier. And this included partners from the nonprofit, private, philanthropic, and governmental sectors, as well as, of course, um, And so we have the city of Philadelphia um, through the Parks and Recreation Department, as well as the Streets Department, um, which today holds the lease for the park and maintains the space, as well as Center City District, which is a development corporation driving the development and capital campaign for phase one of the park. Um, that same group of grassroots neighbors, um, which merged with another group, and then you know, several mergers and organizations later um, formally incorporated into Friends of the Rail Park, um, which is um, what we, we are today. And of course, philanthropic partners. Um, as Kieran mentioned, philanthropy was a key partner in supporting um, uh, the capital campaign to rehabilitate the existing structure early on, but also made key investments, and this is the thing I wanna stress, um, in the social and cultural aspect of the park by providing operating support um, to staff the organization that could then lead stewardship and engage um, surrounding communities and welcome them onto the park and into the space. Um, and so after many years of advocating and planning, the first phase of the park opened in summer of 2018. That is, you know, fast forwarding through a lot of, um, you know, conversations and planning and, and a lot of hard work. Um, but the park was designed by Studio Brian Haynes, which is a Philadelphia-based landscape architecture firm. Um, engineering construction was led by urban engineers. And we went through a very similar um, process of looking at restoration and remediation, and then building additional structures on top of that. So you can see on the, the far right side there, kind of our iconic swings. Um, but there's also a great deal of public art, um, native foliage and plants that were put in as well. And it really transformed the space and serves today as proof of concept um, as we think about the, the next phases and the, the overall vision of the park. Um, now, I hate, I hate showing photos of an empty park, so let's go to the next slide. Um, and so as you can see, I think the next milestone for us as Friends of the Rail Park and for kind of this, this um, coalition of partners driving, driving the, the animation, the activation of the park, was that once for the first phase of the park was completed was to program it. Um, and really connected back to the neighborhoods that it was a part of. So we, as Friends of the Rail Park, hosted walking tours, plant swaps, astronomy nights, game nights, yoga, dance. Um, this is actually a photo of Ballet X, which is a local dance troupe, um, really you know, bringing the park to life. Um, but all this was done in partnership with local arts and cultural organizations, environmental groups, um, social services, local businesses, et cetera. Um, and in our first year of programming, we had over 8,000 people participate um, in the, the different offerings on the park. This of course was pre-COVID and we're, we're re, um, redialing and rethinking our, our strategy going forward. Um, but this is all a lot of work and you're probably asking yourself at this point, why, why I do this? Um, and, and this is due again to that legacy of the, the park and the infrastructure that we're inheriting. 
You have to remember that parks and public spaces are not accessed and experienced equally nor equitably, especially in the United States, um, and that historically railroad checks were often perceived as barriers or boundaries of neighborhoods. So calling into question, even in its you know, uh, completed state for phase one, um, who really is this space for? And so as friends of the rail park, we create programming that is explicitly and also subtly welcoming people onto the park and creating a sense of belonging. And this is mission critical for us. If you go to my next slide, um, this is an example of the more explicit welcoming of people onto the park. This is a Lunar New Year festival um, from 2020, right before the pandemic hit. Um, and this is an example of the culturally specific programming um, that we, we offer as Friends of the Rail Park. Um, everyone is obviously welcome, but we go out of our way to make sure that the work is accessible to our local neighbors, especially in Chinatown. The park is um, situated in the, the north end of Philadelphia's Chinatown. Um, and so we also make sure that all of our materials are translated, that they're as intergenerational as possible, as accessible, et cetera. And that we're doing this in partnership um, with the organizations and individuals who know these communities deeply. So in the case of Lunar New Year, um, we did this um, program in partnership with Asian Arts Initiative, as well as the Philadelphia Chinatown Development Corporation. Um, and our programming and community engagement is really, I think, guided by the spirit of inquiry and iteration. So honoring that everyone is an expert in their community. So how can we work collaboratively with our neighbors and community members to draw out this knowledge and insight and celebrate that um, through the park, um, both its programming, but it's also um, its, its future development as well. So if you go to my, my next and almost last slide, um, just with an eye to the future of the park, um, this is uh, an art installation that I just absolutely love. It's called the Moon Viewing Platform, and it was done in the cut um, in collaboration with Philadelphia Mural Arts. And this is just a beautiful example of working with artists to create something inspiring and beautiful in an undeveloped portion of the park. Um, and really doing what artists do best, right? So offering programming that doesn't tell people what the future faces of the park are going to look like, but help them imagine the possibilities in this space. And I think that's such a great metaphor. Um, so we've kind of alluded to throughout this, the presentations, there are so many communities, you know, both geographically, but also thematically that intersect with these infrastructure reuse projects, whether they're artists or culture bearers or those interested in health and wellness or ecology and the environment. So it's really about thinking about how can we use the rail park as a community platform to surface these different community assets and treasures and then have that reflected in the design and functionality of future phases of the park. And how can we shift from community engagement to community driven development as well? Um, so for my last slide, um, so I, I could talk about the rail park for hours, but I, I think I'm, I'm out of time. So I'll just conclude by saying that, you know, projects like the rail park, projects like the Benerly Viaduct require local actors and local strategies to execute on these, these big, big visions. Um, but at the same time, we're part of a global movement of infrastructure use projects that are supporting community and transforming their cities in the process. And it's just so exciting and so special. And it's such an honor to be on this journey with you all. So thank you very much. Becca, thank you, thank you so much for that. That was really appreciated. We 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 often talk about the potential of heritage uh, or the opportunity of heritage. And what I liked about your presentation was it was potential delivered. You'd, you've done something with it, so that was fabulous to, to see. Right, we've got we've got a variety of different mechanisms for questions coming in, so I'm going to juggle lots of those. And if we can all be on the screen at the same time, my first question actually relates to what. Uh, Kieran and Rebecca have been talking about, and that is uh, about community. And actually, the, the first one I'm going to ask is from Lisa Fransom, who, who wants to know, how do you know if you've been successful with your local community? So perhaps, perhaps we'll go Rebecca to you and then to Kieran. How are you measuring that success? What are you doing about that? I think going back to this this concept of inquiry and iteration, it's 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 asking community directly, like, what do you think about this program that we're offering? What do you think about, um, you know, how the space has been designed and organized, and uh, and then incorporating that feedback into future programs and then eventual design as well. Um, and we've we've certainly heard the the full gamut of feedback from our community members, which um, at times make me chuckle, at times makes me scratch my head. Um, but overall, I think it's again part of this. Um, you know, creating the mechanisms and, and really focusing on community-driven design and collaboration. Okay, thank you. And and Karen, same question to you. How do you know that you're being successful with, with the communities who live either side of Benley? I think it's the amount of engagement that we're getting from, you know, from uh, all the different communities. Um, I mean, we communicate with the communities in, in a whole variety of different ways. We have a 
a membership for the Friends of Benley Viaduct where people can be influential in shaping and developing the project. Um, we have a, a good following on social media. We have newsletters that go out every um, every month. So the local community are, are very much in, engaged in the project. And we are partners, the Friends of Benley Viaduct, who are representing the community, are partners in this project with railway paths. So it's, a, it's an act of collaboration, which is, a, which is working really well. And um, the... I walk my dog down by the viaduct <laughs> every day, and that's probably the best test, to chat to local people, and there is tremendous excitement uh, with the people that I meet who are always asking questions, when is it going to be open? And so there's a, <clears throat> there is a feeling of real optimism that the viaduct is going to be open after, you know, after 50 years of closure. And for the local community, that has generated, in my view, a real sense of pride. And that is what people within the community tell you. Thank you, Kieran. And I, and I, I know your dog is patiently waiting downstairs. <laughs> it's potentially too destructive to be in the room with you right now. Uh, question for, for Tim, perhaps. And that is, we've heard two uh, examples of how railway architecture can be repurposed, brought back to life from different parts of the world. And I guess my, my question for you is, well, what's the the opportunity for sharing and learning internationally? Because this architecture is across the entire world. So there's lots of people facing the same thing. What was the opportunity for sharing and learning internationally, do you think? It's remarkable. I mean, not only is there you know, cross uh, cross nation similarities of, of the engineering and the design of buildings and the form of buildings, um, that collaboration is absolutely essential. For uh, another example, I often give. I, I work with the Sierra Leone National Railway Museum uh, in West Africa, uh, which I've been working with for a number of years, and they have a collection of old British railway rolling stock that discovered in an engine shed that it left there for forty years during the during the wars and so on, and they've turned that engine shed into a community space and they use those vehicles that were found inside it as separate breakout rooms to explore history and culture and that's become a real centre uh, in, in, in Freetown and they've had uh, projects, they've uh, had teams from the museums in the UK have gone out there and we had a cultural exchange programmes and so on. So the architecture can be different in style, in, in its shape and in, 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 in its, its finessing but of course ultimately there are different uses um, and every community and every culture will have different ways of repurposing that but I think the inspiration is, is massive and, and the stuff that I've seen in you know, Philadelphia is remarkable you know we've got it in London as well we have the High Line and there's another one due to happening here as well like up in Camden as well so you know everyone's learning from each other it's great to see. Yes I think for sure one of the things which I see which is I mean we're, we're all passionate about every group will be passionate about heritage but I, I particularly think that railway enthusiasts have got a particular kind of passion for their subject with which is writ large which is writ large which is excellent to see uh, Rebecca same question for you but perhaps phrased slightly differently and that is if you had one piece of advice for the friends of Benley from your experience what what might that piece of advice be? Mm, um, I think for the rail park it's thinking about not only the development of the park and you know creating access to the park itself but also thinking about how community is exiting the benefits of the investment in the space itself so we all know the historic preservation there's always an economic case for it right in terms of the jobs created etc so how are we making sure that we're linking that back to community and setting up those opportunities while we're still in these kind of planning phases um, and then we're they're kind of available to community going forward as well and that's something that we're continuing to think about and grapple with um, as we develop future phases of the rail park as well Okay, thank you. Uh, and uh, one of the things which I, I I really enjoy about this this type of heritage, this uh, sort of industrial transport heritage, is the fact that, and you've touched, you both, all three, in fact, have touched upon it, and that is that yes, it's about the conservation of bricks and mortar, or, or in this case, stone and wrought iron. So it's about that. But actually, it's also about the way in which heritage crosses over into uh, wildlife and the environment. We, you know, we are it's Earth Day today, and you can imagine the opportunities to to experience the the outdoors and, and wildlife in in both those sites is is writ large. Similarly, 
Uh, uh, Kieran, you've touched upon this. The, 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 these places are used for exercising, for walking the dog, uh, for for cycling. All those things are, are, are part of health and well-being, and particularly mental health. So, so I guess the the question again, perhaps for you all this time, is: uh, Do do you think that? these kind of initiatives open up opportunities for new audiences, ones which perhaps are, aren't are the normal audiences who might want to visit the Taj Mahal or might go into a classical Georgian mansion in nearby Derbyshire. What do you think? Perhaps, Tim, to you first. <laughs> um, I, I think there, there, are, there are different ways of using those spaces. Um, it's, it's interesting. Um, there are quite a lot of railway paths that, as, as I, I know that Kieran is familiar with of railway paths. That rail paths has been involved in this. Well, they've turned them into bike tracks, right? So that's access for all. And, and we're very lucky in the UK that because a lot of the stuff was sold off at a similar time, um, we have Sustrans and these, these groups who've turned hundreds of miles of, of infrastructure into public accessible stuff, which has brought people into those places and spaces onto those bridges, into tunnels. And so we're quite familiar with those in the UK, I think, and, and you know, experiencing a, perhaps a, a green bit of transport. Um, I, I think, again, th those places that are buildings or old stations that you get as well in centres of towns where you have very large spaces around a railway station that are now defunct. And we have one down, down in Folkestone, for example, down on the seafront. And they've turned that into a gardening area as well. And they kind of repurpose that, that industrial stuff to, to use it for perhaps minority groups who don't have a space elsewhere in an urban environment because suddenly, you know, they've got an acre or two acres to play with. You know, how do you repurpose that? And, and, and that's lovely to see, to have this brownfield site given a, a multiple use at the heart of the community. Thank you, Tim. How, how about you, Rebecca? Are you reaching new audiences through this, this infrastructure, through your project? You... Yeah, it's it's so exciting. And I think the, the pandemic has also, and kind of uh, re-examining how people even use space has really um, been a pivotal moment for us as well. And so we are now focusing less so on just sheer, getting sheer numbers of people onto the, the park, right? But thinking about the, the kind of quality of the experience they have while they're there. Um, and so we're thinking a lot about kind of this health and wellness aspect, the, the kind of mindfulness that can be practiced while you're in an outdoor public space. Um, as I had mentioned, I think during my presentation, um, the neighborhood that the first phase of the park is in has, it's something like 4% tree cover. There are really no parks or playgrounds. So this is it for that community. Um, and so it's, you know, how do we just make it as welcoming as possible and getting people onto the park and then offering um, in a kind of self-guided manner um, opportunities for them to really experience the space as well. So one thing that we've been experimenting with, for example, is a, a podcast series where you can actually, um, you know, download a self-guided tour of the park to experience it. Um, we're working on a walking meditation of the space right now. So thinking again about um, just making it as accessible and kind of interpreted for people as possible. So in a way, it's it's people, it's heritage, but people are not seeing it as heritage. They're seeing it as the local park. They're seeing it as a place for art. They're seeing it as uh, all of those things. Yeah. yeah. Um, go, Rebecca, go. <laughs> I was just going to say, I, I think it's such a beautiful um, example, to me at least, um, of this kind of intersection of the environment and heritage um, is uh, captured by this idea of the polonia tree. I don't know if uh, you have those in, in Britain, but it's... Um, there's a whole story behind the tree. They originated actually in, in Asia and were used, um, the wood was used for furniture, but the pods were used as, as basically uh, nature's packing peanut from you know way back when. Um, and so they would be, all these pods would be thrown into these um, boxcars and they would, you know, the trains would bring them across the country um, and the, you know, the pods would fall off and the polonia tree would, would sprout. And so to me, um, the polonia tree is something that is kind of ubiquitous with uh, not only railroad infrastructure and, and kind of, um, the design of these spaces, um, but also that that natural environment of what is the foliage of you know kind of railroad history, and that's the polonia tree. And so, um, you know, kind of bringing those two worlds together and providing that interpretation, I think, is also just like a really interesting touch point um, for these kind of two um, sometimes disparate groups of, of interest um, or, or stakeholders. Okay, thank you, Rebecca. Uh, Kieran, what about you in terms of? Are you seeing new new audiences, people engaging with this place that you you hadn't expected? Is it providing opportunities for them? I think when I first started uh, getting involved in this project, I thought it would be primarily um, be populated by people who loved railways and railway enthusiasts. But what I found 
if there's a massive cross-section of the community that are involved in Benley Viaduct. Now, some may, may enjoy the project because of its architecture and the railways and the engineering, but then there's other groups of people who love the viaduct because of the range of plants that are down there. The, the botanists go down to the viaduct to see the orchids. People go down to the viaduct to see the newts and the bats and the butterflies. And this, there's a huge kind of cross-section of people that come together at the viaduct and we all enter into each other's different worlds. And I find that fascinating in that I found, I'm not an engineer, but I found out so much about the engineering of the viaduct. I'm not a botanist, but I know loads of plants at the viaduct. I know the trees that were planted down there uh, have been planted to attract certain kinds of butterflies. And all this expertise is within the community. And I think a big challenge for the project is to, to harness all that expertise and energy and love that people have for the viaduct and use that for the, you know, to develop the project in the future. So, yeah, we get a, a huge mixture of, of, of people down the viaduct. Um, and I think coming out of the pandemic where we've all been locked in our houses for, you know, such a long time, there's a, a real thirst for people to be able to access nature. And they've got that on the doorsteps. They don't have to, you know, to pay to go 50 miles in a, a train or a bus or a car to, a, you know, to a stately home. This heritage is theirs and it's on the doorstep. And that is one of the, you know, the beauties of the project for me. Okay, thank you, Kieran. Uh, I've got a question from Mitchell Grubler, uh, and he's uh, interested in in the High Line and its impact in terms of actually fostering very high uh, uh, end luxury residential along its route, uh, and therefore, and perhaps the, the implication is maybe squeezing out the local community. What? How? How do you respond to things like that? Uh, get Rebecca, perhaps uh, I think in terms of the Benelli context, it's perhaps less relevant. I may be wrong, uh, but Re Rebecca, for you in Philadelphia, how do you how do you address that that issue? Mm -hmm. I think this goes back to my earlier comment, I think, about um, not only accessing the park, but making sure that communities are able to access the benefits of the park. Um, and so going back to things like procurement strategies when we're talking about construction or, you know, kind of just jobs created by these spaces, um, you know, thinking very carefully before we've developed future phases of the park about kind of property values and how we can you know, put policy mechanisms in place, again, with our, our community partners and using Friends of the Rail Park as kind of the, the organizer, the intermediary of that, that work, but thinking about what are the policy mechanisms we can put a place in place at the city level um, to kind of capture that potential value and make sure that's coming back to community. And I think that's, again, something that um, as these projects spring up across the country, across the globe, um, more and more park projects and parks are thinking about these things. And so we're, we're also kind of following along to figure out how we do this and do it in an equitable um, manner with an eye to equitable development. Good question. Good question. Good answer. Uh, I'm going to leave the, the last question I can leave for, for, for Tim, actually, because it uh, I think you might have a kind of global international view. And that this is from Steve Sharp. And that is... Uh, does Tim see any other railway infrastructure elsewhere in the UK, but I'm going to add all the world, <laughs> absolutely crying out to be saved and repurposed? So I'm afraid uh, the rail park and Benley, you, you can't answer this one. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Uh, okay, well, I'll, I'll put Benley to one side for the minute. Um, I, I, I actually would hold up these two for example. So, so I would give specifics, but I think any uh, bit of infrastructure that has, I suppose, connecting communities, um, one that runs between two places or is central to a community, because it's got to have money put into it and it's got to have a viable future and a practical future. So a lot of people in, in Britain can say, Let, let's restore this, let's rebuild that, let's try and do that. But actually they're off in the middle of nowhere and, and you, know, it, it, you think, who's going to use it? Who's going to actually enjoy it? Who's going to benefit from it? What, what is the long-term vision? Um, and you've got to have a plan for that. So I think there's stuff in France, in around Paris, there's a little Petit Centure, which, which is this the kind of little railway line that runs around the edge of Paris. Um, that's a repurposing for an urban park. I think there's stuff in Britain to be done, more cycle paths to be done. I think that, you know, there is so much to be done with, with old rail infrastructure and, and the world really is your oyster. 
Thank you. I, I knew that was an impossible question to answer, but <laughs> I thought I'd pose it anyway. Uh, we're, we're almost out of time, so uh, and and we could literally talk on for hours and hours. But I'm I'm conscious of Kieran's dog needing a walk, uh, so. So I'm going to wrap it up now. Uh, and the, the first people I have to thank, the primary people I have to thank is uh, our three panellists who you've been absolutely wonderful. I love that national, international, local view, different perspectives coming in on this, this fascinating topic, which I know drives many, you know, many people, people's passion. And we can, we can see that passion in you. So, so my, my first and, and major thanks to all three of you for, for a wonderful presentations and great answers. So thank you very much indeed. I'm sure virtual applause from everyone and real applause from me. So thank you for thank you for joining me. If anyone's interested in the work uh, uh, of the Rail Park or Benelli or indeed Tim's television program, uh, look in the chat because there'll be links to all that information there, so you can explore in more detail the the, the projects and the work that they've initiated. So so do take a look at that. Uh, the, the question I posed to Tim, uh, oh, sorry, one more people, group of people I have to thank is the, the New York chapter of uh, American Institute of Architects, uh, our partners in this event. So thank you very much for your support there. Uh, the reason I asked Tim that question at the end is because uh, we're always interested in World Monuments Fund on in terms of the watch cycle. And we mentioned this at the very beginning. Ben Ali Vardak came to us through the watch. And it's that watch is all about highlighting every two years, 25 sites across the world. Uh, so I was trying to see if Tim had any any ideas for the 2022 watch. But uh, apart from the, the one around Paris, he's he's he, yeah, he's given some good ideas. But my encouragement to all you out there looking is if you've got any good ideas where you've got uh, a piece of heritage connected to community, I think that point's really important, but might also answer not only a, a local problem, but might help the, a world problem, uh, you know, contribute globally, uh, we'd be interested to hear from you. You've got a, a couple of weeks left before the nominations close, but please have a look at the 2022 watch. Uh, I think it remains for me to say that the next digital event is going to take place on the 6th of May for us, uh, and that is the uh, Heritage Now event. Uh, where we are titled Afghanistan, Cultural Heritage and the Forever War. So uh, an equally fascinating discussion with Rory and Shoshona Stewart and Omar Sharifi, uh, which please join us for that. Uh, again, my thanks to my panellists. Uh, you've been fantastic. Uh, my thanks to everyone else for joining us. Have a very fine day wherever you are. Uh, thank you very much and goodbye. <laughs>